Everybody knows Tyrannosaurus rex. It's the dinosaur, the prehistoric animal that more than any other encapsulates and embodies the primal power and terror of the ancient world. We know it as the apex predator of late Cretaceous Laramidia, or what constituted what is now the western portion of North America. But what if T. rex wasn't the only species within Tyrannosaurus? What if there were actually three, and T. rex wasn't the biggest one? Today we'll be discussing a new paper by veteran paleontologist and paleoartist Gregory S. Paul, famous for authoring the various Princeton field guides to dinosaurs, predatory dinosaurs of the world, and for essentially inventing our modern understanding of anatomically rigorous skeletals. He's contributed a great deal to the field, and has been publishing for decades. With such a long track record, however, you're bound to come up with some controversial ideas. In 2022, Paul led a study arguing for T-Rex to be split into three species. Tyrannosaurus Imperator, or the Tyrant Lizard Emperor, Tyrannosaurus Rex, the Tyrant Lizard King, and Tyrannosaurus Regina, or the Tyrant Lizard Queen. T. Imperator was represented by the more robust specimens from earlier in the late Cretaceous, while T. rex came later and was slightly less robust. T. regina coexisted with T. rex and was the most gracile of the three. The paper was, essentially, laughed out of town by just about every Tyrannosaur expert in the field and mostly forgotten about. It was the first paper to bring attention to the gigantic cope specimen though, so that's something. Now, in 2025, Paul has done it again. This new paper is titled, A Presentation of the Current Data on the Exceptionally Diverse non tyrannosaurid Eutyrannosaur and Tyrannosaurini Genera and Species of Western North America During the End Cretaceous North American Interchange. <gasps> Quite a mouthful. In a nutshell, he resurrects the argument for splitting Tyrannosaurus into three species, and also proposes that there were multiple medium-sized non tyrannosaurid Tyrannosaurus with long arms, running around as contemporaries and competitors to Tyrannosaurus, including Nanotyrannus and Stygivenator. There are some questionable methods in this paper, to say the least, but he also raises some really good points, and I want to be fair to his premise. When it comes to new ideas in science, we should try to look at the evidence without forcing our own presuppositions onto what we're seeing, and draw conclusions from that. One of Paul's main arguments that he repeats throughout the paper is that if animals like Despletosaurus and Allosaurus can be split based on relatively fragmentary remains and minor diagnostic characteristics, then he should be able to do the same with Tyrannosaurus, but was attacked in 2022 for trying to alter a famous dinosaur. I, I see the logic there. Consistency is important to strive for, after all. Alright then, Paul, you have my attention. What characters justify splitting Tyrannosaurus? The first is robusticity. According to the skull and femur measurements he uses in the paper, the specimens he groups in Tyrannosaurus Imperator are the most robust. This includes famous specimens like Samson, Sue, MOR008, who he names Bill instead of Custer for some reason, Jennings, Tristan, Trix, and B-Rex. Their skulls are wider and thicker than those assigned to T-Rex, which includes Scotty, CM9380, who I named Arwen and he named Barnum, and Tuff's Love. Tyrannosaurus Regina is apparently the most gracile and lightly built of the three claiming specimens like Stan, Harley, Thomas, Wankel, Pex Rex, and Black Beauty. Two things catch my attention. These specimens are a mix of fully grown and immature individuals, which causes me to question the validity of taxonomically sorting them by robusticity index. And the measurement standards for the femora are not stated. It's likely that the femurs listed here are measured at different points, which pretty much tosses that portion of his diagnosis out the window. He also doesn't list circumference data, which makes estimating robusticity for femurs at all an impossibility. In his supplementary information, he makes the claim that stratigraphy doesn't need to be precise to um, support his stratigraphy-based argument. That's quite the claim. While there might be a slight trend towards gracility as time goes on for Tyrannosaurus, I certainly wouldn't consider that grounds for creating two new species. There are more characters to justify it, chiefly post-orbital bosses, small protrusions of bone above the eyes. Paul defines T. Imperator as those with post-orbital bosses that sometimes form a long spindle and lack the tall, protruding discs of Rex. T. Rex then must always have tall, protruding discs on its post-orbitals, right? Right? Nope. Paul writes that for Rex, the post-orbital bosses are sometimes prominent subcircular knob-like discs limited to the frontal process. Wait, so your characters for both T. Imperator and T. Rex only sometimes look like what you're basing the species off of? Not to mention that the holotype for T. Rex, CM9380, doesn't even preserve that part of the skull. What about T. Regina? That's gotta be consistent. Let's see. Post-orbital bosses do not project much above dorsal rim of the skull, do not often extend onto squamosal process, are sometimes hat-shaped, presumably among mature males, low spindles or tall discs not present. I'm sorry, there's that word again. Sometimes? Hat-shaped? 
There's nothing quantitative about this, much less consistent. If we genuinely did see consistently observable and stratigraphically unique post-orbital boss shapes across the genus, I could see where he was coming from. But his illustrations in his own paper demonstrate the lack of anatomical coherence in his definitions. Where did these definitions come from, then? Does he have a new method of phylogenetic analyses and coding that the rest of us aren't aware of? Such an advanced technology, capable of creating unified species from disparate characters subject to individual variation, would be of great use to the rest of the plebeian paleontologists out there. Paul does expand on his methodology in the supplementary information for the paper. He utilizes a cutting-edge, entirely objective, quantitative method known as the Human Visual Neural Pattern Recognition. To quote, If two specimens look like the same species, taking size and possible sexual differences into consideration, they probably are. If they don't, they probably are not. So, he just used his eyes. No phylogenetic analysis, no mathematical scoring of characters, no matrix. It's actually just vibes. I get where he's coming from, different animals should look different, but when you're trying to use relatively insignificant characters to create two new species, you might want to see if those characters are objectively even present in the way you think you see them. There is very little consistency in the post-orbital bosses as he illustrated them, even within the species he's attempting to validate. If you're using your eyeball vibes to call these three different morphs, I'm using my eyeball vibes to call that individual variation. That's not all though. Paul wrote that T. regina and Rex were also characterized by only having one anterior incisive formed entry tooth, while T. imperator usually had two. I'm, I'm not terribly confident in using what could very well be coincidental tooth placement in a heterodont genus to erect multiple new species. A pretty neat idea proposed by the paper is that the specimens with the larger post-orbital bosses across all three species are more likely to be male. The bosses could be used as display structures to impress females. I really don't think we can be certain about that, but it's a fun enough idea, and I'd like to see some paleo art of it at least. Then there are the unrealistically low body masses. Paul is the king of shrink wrapping and has been for 40 plus years. He still puts giant wreck specimens like Sue and Scotty at less than 8 metric tons, figures that were left behind in the 2000s as volumetric estimation became more and more advanced. For reference, here's a view from Bates et al. 2009 of MOR 555, wrapped with just enough soft tissue to weigh 6,300 kilograms, and it's horrifically emaciated. He also puts Stan at 7.5 tons, who already looked skinny at 8.1 tons. Both of these specimens are much smaller than Sue or Scotty. It really puts Paul's mummification of megatheropods into perspective. Don't get me wrong, I would absolutely love for Tyrannosaurus Imperator to be a thing. It's an epic name, and since it would have the most robust Tyrannosaurus specimens, it would end up being the biggest adult theropod on average by a notable margin. Throw Sue, Cope, Goliath, and Samson into a sample of a half dozen and make YouTube shorts about how T. Imperator weighed over 10 tons on average. The problem is that the case for the Tyrant Lizard Emperor is incredibly weak, as things currently stand. Attempting to split T-Rex again, and potentially holding T. macrayensis at arm's length, wasn't the only controversial take in this paper. Paul also argued for the existence of multiple small to medium tyrannosaurs that lived alongside T-Rex, including Nanotyrannus and Stygivenator. His arguments for Nanotyrannus include a higher tooth count than Tyrannosaurus, forelimbs that are as large or larger than adult T-Rexes, a dentary groove allegedly not present in Tyrannosaurus, and a longer tibia than femur. The hind limb proportions could easily be explained by ontogeny and individual variation, but two of those traits might be genuine evidence for Nanotyrannus, at least being valid. Especially when you account for James Napoli's recent work on ontogenetically invariant characters in Archosaurus, which also supports Nanotyrannus. Bringing back Stygivenator is a choice, since it's usually considered to be a juvenile T-Rex with a bit of a weird maxilla. Maybe future studies will bear that diagnosis out. I'm not a Stygivenator expert and can't speak authoritatively on the subject. To sum up the paper, while the idea of multiple Tyrannosaurus species apart from T. macrayensis is awesome, especially the super bulky Tyrannosaurus Imperator, it doesn't have much of a case going for it at the moment. I expect to see more Tyrannosaur experts dismantle this study in greater detail than I have and look forward to their input. Perhaps we can all utilize the human neural visual pattern recognition technique we're born with and create our own taxa based on the slight angle of a third maxillary tooth we observe in specimen photos online. And maybe one day we'll actually know how old T-Mac is so we can figure out if it's its own species or just a slightly wonky rex. I won't hold my breath though since the dating of the Hall Lake formation seems to flip between the Campanian and Maastrichtian every six months. Oh well, thanks for watching. I wrote this script at 5am after waking up at 3 and seeing there was a new Tyrannosaurus split study by GSP. I hope that you enjoyed it. I strongly recommend reading the original study for yourself and forming your own opinions. There's a link in the description, so please check it out if you're interested. I'd also appreciate if you subscribed to help support the channel so I can keep doing scientific analysis pieces like this one. If you feel that Tyrannosaurus Imperator and Regina should be valid, drop your reasons in the comments. 
There may be factors that either I don't know about or failed to consider, and I would love for Team Pierder in particular to be real. Also, check out my new merch over at Vividend Fossil Fits on 4th Wall, including the big paleo sports jersey to show your support for academic elitism. My wife is the new merch manager, so you can expect fresh designs as she channels her creativity to come up with awesome stuff. Join the channel to receive loyalty badges and shoutouts at the Raptor tier with early access to videos at the Megatherapod tier. I'm the Vividend, and I'll see you next time. There are many species of Tyrannosaur in this world, Frodo, for good or for evil. Some are less valid than I am, and against some I have not yet been phylogenetically tested. <laughs>